Okay, welcome to the last afternoon of uh, the JuliaCon talks. Um, this got snuck on the schedule by Veral. I was volunteered. Uh, promises have been made, and uh, we've got to answer for things we said last year. Um, actually, if you if you watch my Julia 1.0 talk, I very carefully do not actually promise anything. Um, <laughs> So Julia 1.0, uh, obviously it's not out here yet. Uh, we just released 0 0.6. Um, eh, we always knew this timeline was aggressive. You gotta, you gotta draw a line in the sand and then blow right past it. Um, but we did get a lot done. Uh, 0 0.6 was a pretty, pretty epic release. Um, some of the huge things that happened, uh, the type system changes that Jeff talked about, uh, upgrading LLVM as usual involves crazy compile time regressions, which we then have to spend like months firefighting to put out. And by we, I mean Jeff and Jameson and Keno. Um, I had nothing to do with it. So some questions. Uh, I was gonna add uh, one before this, so I'm just gonna go back. Uh, what was good and what was bad? So I would say that of the things that we did differently in terms of process, it was actually really good to do an alpha and a beta. I never really understood previously what alphas and betas were about. I was like, you just make some release candidates and then put it out. What's the point of this? Um, the point is, as it turns out, social signaling. So you put out an alpha and that is a signal to everybody, now is the time to upgrade your packages and try this thing out. A few of the things that we have found that were actually a problem would have been caught if people had upgraded earlier. So then the next time around, I encourage you, when we put out 1.0 alpha, Try it, upgrade stuff, let us know, because that is the last chance to fix it. Um, so some questions. Uh, how much of 1.0 are we actually done with at this point? Uh, and how does this compare to past releases? So this is a spreadsheet that we did. We, we internally at Julia Computing consider Julia itself a product, even though we don't charge for it, but it's essential to our business model and growing it is the best thing we can do to actually increase our user base and therefore our business base. So these were some of, this was a spreadsheet we made of things that needed to get done. And then I added completeness as a percentage, which was just me making up percentages. So, you know, with a grain of salt and all. Uh, deferred means like what percentage of this are we just going to do later? So zero means we're doing it all for 1.0. 100% uh, deferred means we're doing none of it for 1.0. Uh, and the total therefore is how much, well, I probably should have subtracted one from one uh, for the total because it's how much remains to be done for 1.0. So if it's 100% done, then we don't have to do anything, but some of it might happen afterwards. Uh, I know this is a little hard to read, but uh, type system redesign, vectorized operations with fusing dots, uh, converting docs from RST to Markdown, finished string of Palooza. Um, and then there's some things where we were like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Reimplement string with buffer. We didn't really do that, but as Jeff pointed out, the thing we have now is effectively indistinguishable, so who cares? Um, I don't know, at the far opposite end, uh, you know, bin depths to, uh, had no work, almost no work has been done and it really needs to happen. PKG3, I'm calling it 75% done. That's, you know, it's definitely 75% design done. I don't know about coding done. That's a different story. Uh, conditional, something about conditional modules. It's not really going to be conditional modules, but we need some way to road, load pieces of code that sort of support gluing two packages together. Uh, that's 0% done and needs to get done. Um, so the, actually the most interesting numbers here are probably at the top, they're, they're the averages. So we got 48% of what we set out to do done. That's not bad for given that we're not even at 1.0 yet. Uh, and we've decided to defer 25% of it. So these are things that we decided not a good idea. Actually, we don't want to do it or we can do it after 1.0. So total, we got 70, 73% of our work done. Uh, and we're not even at the release yet. So that's not bad. So. Uh, the, a little bit of perspective, the Julia release history looks like this. So 0 0.1, February 2013, November 2013, 0.2, August 2014. Okay, you can read, so I don't have to read these out loud. Uh, so we were actually on a pretty steady release cycle of 9.2 months. Um, almost exactly the same number of days between point, point 0.1 and point 0.2 and point 0.2 and point 0.3. 
things went off the rails a little bit with point four. I don't remember this being that bad, but looking at the dates, I'm like, oh my God, 13.8 months. That's her horrible. Um, it should not take longer than it takes to make a baby to make a release. <laughs> um, and then, you know, point five was not great either. 11.6 months. I remember this one being worse, but apparently it wasn't. Uh, and now we're back down to 9.1 months. That's actually not bad. Uh, of course, we set out for six months, so, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Um, but it was an epic release. There was a lot of stuff in it. Okay, so what do we do for 1.0? 1, 1. Uh, the milestone on GitHub is, I am assured, now fairly accurate. Jeff is happy with the reflection of what is in there as issues for what we actually have to do. Um, there's nothing huge planned for this release. So none of the crazy stuff like, uh, you know, Array Mageddon or Stringapalooza or the complete type system revamp. Uh, is going to happen. There's just there's just nothing of that magnitude, which is good because that's the kind of thing that you know you do it and then you spend several months fixing bugs and trying to like get things to actually work properly again. Um, so it's a lot of cleanup and a lot of planning ahead for 1.x. So we would like to you know if we know we're going to add some feature, we don't have to add the feature yet, but we need to make sure that when we add the feature, we don't break people's code, and that takes a little bit of planning ahead. Uh, and we tried to do a lot of that in 0 0.6, but you know, this is, this is our chance. This is now's the time. Um, so we need to like, brutally go through and triage issues and things we're planning on doing and just be like anything that can be done non-breaking post 1.0, just we're not doing it now. We'll just do it in 1.1 or 1.2. Um, you know, those, that includes optimizations, compiler improvements, features, any of these things, any feature that can be added without breaking people's code is fine, like 1.1, 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.2, whenever we want to add it, we can do it. Um, you know, for example, I think I convinced Keno not to upgrade LLVM from 3.91 to 5, because every time we upgrade LLVM, there's like a whole slew of, it's not even bugs, I mean, sometimes it's compiler issues, but it's really more just like pr uh, compiler performance regressions. So we don't want to deal with that, we can deal with it later. <laughs> Uh, and we should prioritize the most disruptive changes as early in the release as possible. So figure out what's going to cause problems, do it, you know, this month. Julia 0.7, what is this? Oh my god, is there another release? People are freaking out, I can tell. <laughs> um, so you may have heard some talk about this or seen it. In fact, the version file now contains 0.7.0 uh, .0 dev. Um, don't worry, we are not doing an extra release cycle. Um, 0 0.7 is just 1.0 with deprecations, and then we're going to delete the deprecations and 1.0 is the exact same thing. So that effectively gives us an additional deprecation cycle, so to upgrade from 0 0.6, uh, you just port your code to 0 0.7, fix all the deprecation warnings, the usual rigmarole, it's usually not that hard, just, you know, look at the, look at the warnings and fix them. Um, then you switch to 1.0 and fix anything you missed. Uh, sometimes, you know, deleting the deprecations causes some subtle thing to just break because a binding doesn't exist or that you were inadvertently relying on. Um, so that's it. Uh, we also changed it to capital dev so that the sort order is correct because we couldn't, uh, you may have noticed that they're, the RCs are pre, wait, no, the alpha was pre.alpha, which is because we realized that dev comes after alpha in the alphabet, so anyway, yeah, you get it. <laughs> All right, so beyond 1.0. Um, I had previously said that uh, 2.0 might only be one to two years after 1.0. Remains to be seen, but we're rethinking that because it might be annoying. Um, you know, people really want a stable base to work on, something that they can count on for five years plus. So, you know, there's a ton of stuff that we can do. Uh, you know, we can do op like optimizations up the wazoo. By definition, an optimization does not change behavior. So there are so many things we can spend our time and energy on here to make people's code go faster. Um, upgrading infrastructure, you know, Post 1.0 is a great time to up upgrade all of the libraries we depend on. That should not change anything from the user experience, but you know it does take time and energy to actually do it. Uh, adding features, you know, adding traits, multiple inheritance, uh, you know, inheriting from one thing is a subcase of inheriting from multiple things. So that seems like a thing we can do without breaking anybody's code. 
uh, work on key packages. I mean, you know, the core team doesn't have to only work on base Julia. Data structures is a pretty essential package that needs a little bit of love. Uh, we got to sort out this whole data frames, data tables sort of thing, which a lot of people are working very hard on, but, you know, we got to sort it out. Um, tooling, debugging, profiling, static analysis, all of these things will be great to focus on. I think a lot can be done with analyzing, statically analyzing Julia code in the future. That's all I got. Questions? Yes. So we got a percentage of an unknown quantity. Do you have any? Did we get anything else? <laughs> um, what, what would you like? A date. A date. Oh, um, yeah, I'm a little reluctant on that, but uh, I don't know, like fourth quarter? Q4 in business terms? I don't know. That gives me a little bit of latitude, like three months to play with. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'd really like to get this thing in shape and on the road by, you know, the end of the summer. Um, but we've, we've all learned that, you know, even when you do a feature freeze, like, ah, oh, feature freeze takes a month. And then, I, you know, I don't know how they do it in other projects. Rust, like, has this, would they have like a six, what is it, a 90-day release cycle? Like, how do you even do that? Feature gates? Okay. But doesn't that mean everybody just works on nightly all the time? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I, we don't want to do that. But the, the 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 flip side is then you know you uh, you suffer through these like fairly long freeze feature freeze and RC cycles. But you know the good thing is like the the releases are solid. They really don't have a lot of problems. Um, yes. Sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, so the question. Mm. Okay, so the question is: Are we going to switch to a specification-based model anytime? Uh, as in, like, we write down what we think it should do, and then we implement it. Yeah, so we've, we've tried to do that a bit with uh, Julips, the Julia enhancement proposals. There's a repo in Julia Lang for that. Um, we're not doing a great job of it. I mean, I wrote a Julip for PKG3, and there was a lot of, like, you know, arguing about some fairly nitty-gritty stuff, and, uh, and then it languished for a while, and then I finally, you know, decided, oh, crap, I need to do this thing and actually implement it. And it's still just me so far. But I just released it yesterday, so it's on my Stefan Karpinski slash PKG3. Check it out. Um, I, I think, oh, thank you. I, I, I wasn't fishing for applause, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Very gratifying. Um, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of successful open source projects have not gone specification based, uh, but I guess Python does PEPs. Does that qualify as far as you're concerned? Oh yeah, we're not gonna do that, no. <laughs> No, because I mean the C++ model is all about, like it comes from an era where people would, there'd be a specification and then the specifiers don't even implement the thing. Like they just, they're like, oh, go forth and implement. And then there's like 10 different competing implementations. Um, so, and, and the, you know, the open source scripting language world has worked completely in the opposite direction. There is one definitive implementation. Um, and the reason is, you know, is because it's open. Why would you make another one? So in Python, you get forks because people want better performance, but I think our philosophy has to be, and always has been, like, no, the default implementation should be the good one. It should be the one that is crazy fast and has all the features and not any of the bugs. Um, so, I, yeah, um, it's an aspiration, but you know. Uh, so, so I think that you're, we're gonna continue to have like a definitive implementation be the way to go. Um, but yes, I think the enhancement proposal style is probably what, what we should do f shoot for in the future. Chris. Yeah, so I, I remember that one of the reasons for saying that uh, 2.0 would be on a quicker release cycle was to try to stop 
solve the problems of like Python, Python 2, Python 3, you know, packages not changing or all that kind of issue. Is there any way that you see that, you know, do you see this kind of problem happening or what are some ways that, uh, that we have that will try to stop this kind of, you know, ecosystem not evolving mm -hmm. with the language? Uh, so the question essentially was how do we avoid the Python 2.3 situation? Um, so I'd point out that other languages have successfully avoided this in the past. Uh, so, you know, Ruby had no trouble going from, you know, 1.8, 1.9, 2.0. Uh, Perl successfully transitioned from 4 to 5 and then 6 happened and you're like, well, that's just a totally different language. Um, I, so I think a, a couple of key things issues happened with Python. Um, one of them is that uh, it's it, it, they almost seem to willfully make it impossible to support both versions at the same time. So we will definitely make it possible. And in the style that we've kept, we've done it with the compat package, you know, you write the most recent version of the code in your library, um, but we make it possible to smoothly support older versions for people who are, st who are not, you know, living on the bleeding edge. Um, and that way, you know, the, I think what you saw pe people do, what you saw happening in Python was that, you know, everybody with a significant app sized application, there's some package that hasn't been upgraded, so they're stuck on two. So, and support, if for libraries, supporting two and three at the same time was impossible for a very long time, so, you know, you just have this deadlock situation. Um, if the if the libraries can be upgraded to the new version, then the applications can also upgrade, and you don't have that chicken and egg problem. So I think that's essential. Um, another thing is that you know you got to give people. Uh, you know I feel like Python three initially was more more vinegar than honey. Um, there weren't a lot of really compelling features that made people desperate to change. If we when we do Julia two point oh, there were going to be features that people are dying for, or we wouldn't we wouldn't do it. So, yes. So, so that sounds like Julia 2 is the version that you guys actually want, and Julia 1 is what you're putting up. Julia 10 is the version we really want. That thing is going to fly. It's going to be amazing. So you get what I'm saying? Like, if you can foresee that there is a need for Julia 2 now, then, then, then that says that Julia 1 is necessarily somewhat complete, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But we've got, got to ship. Got to get something out the door. Got to get something stable that people can really rely on. Um, yeah, Scott. Um, one thing that has been asked for for a long time um, is slimming down things. And your wonderful work on Packages 3 might make something that possible. I didn't, uh, I didn't see anything on your list about that. Oh, you, I mean, this is not a complete feature list, but. Um, uh, the question was about slimming down base. Uh, Alex Arslan has actually done phenomenal work on this already. He has torn out uh, several large chunks of base and uh, fed them to the wolves. Yeah, we like could do that. To ask such a discussion is moved to later because the program needs to move on. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone.